Over the past 50 plus years, Charles Koch grew his family business, Koch Industries, into one of the largest privately held companies in America while playing a leading role in creating or supporting the modern libertarian movement and some of its major institutions. Among them, the Cato Institute, the Institute for Humane Studies, Mercatus Center, and the Charles Koch Foundation, a nonprofit that supports many organizations, including Reason Foundation, the publisher of Reason Magazine. Along with his brother David, who passed away last Last year, at the age of 79, the 85-year-old billionaire became not only one of the most successful businessmen in the country, but among the most controversial, with leftists blaming the Koch brothers for many of our contemporary problems. Koch has just published Believe in People, a book that seeks to offer a paradigm shift that calls for all of us to move away from the top-down approach to solving the really big problems by instead empowering people from the bottom up to act on their unique gifts and contribute to the lives of others. In a conversation with Koch and his co-author, Brian Hooks, who is chairman and CEO of Stand Together and the president of the Charles Koch Foundation, I discussed the 2020 election, the successes and failures of the libertarian movement, and what they see as the defining challenges and opportunities in the coming decade. Charles Koch, Brian Hooks, thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Nick. Nick. Good to see you again. It's been a few years. It has indeed. Um, uh, so <clears throat> as a starting point, Charles, could you uh, kind of give what's the controlling idea of believe in people? It's the idea that that transformed my life and and that of so many others and enabled me to accomplish more than I ever dreamed. And so so my goal with the book is to is is to uh, use it to help many more people benefit from these ideas. And these mm -hmm. are the principles of human progress, which uh, are in large part have to do with bottom up empowering of people. And when that happens, and people are empowered, uh, many of them become social entrepreneurs. And when there are enough of these social entrepreneurs, as we've through, seen throughout history, they transform society and move it. It's never been perfect and never will be perfect because human beings aren't perfect, toward, directionally toward a society, morally, more of equal rights and mutual benefit where people succeed by assisting one another and everyone has the opportunity to realize their potential. So that's, that's what this, this book is about. And, and it tells the story, my story, which is the, probably the least interesting, but the story of people through history who have changed society, ch transformed themselves, transformed society by being social entrepreneurs, and then talks about the work we're doing today and all the social, the thousands of social entrepreneurs we're helping to empower others to change their lives and help everybody rise. Right, and uh, a lot of these issues have to do with things like education, uh, substance abuse, housing, whatever. Brian, who, who's a, an exemplary social entrepreneur um, th and can you explain in the book and can you explain how that fits together with the larger group Stand Together? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as, as Charles said, we, uh, we tell a lot of different stories about people and social entrepreneurs that we think exemplify this model of bottom-up solutions. You know, the, the three big ideas in the book that while there's going to be a ton of different uh, solutions to all of the different challenges that come at our country, what they all have in common is this, this core belief in people that it's, it makes more sense to empower people from the bottom up invest in those that are closest to the problems as the source of the solutions, and then unite with anybody to do right. You look at an a organization that we feature uh, in the preface and, and a group that we've worked with at Stand Together for, I guess, the better part of four years now, a group called the Family Independence Initiative. I think they exemplify uh, each one of those, those big ideas. Family Independence Initiative was uh, founded by a guy named Mauricio Miller, run by a guy named Jesus Herrera. The thing that both Jesus and Mauricio have in common is that they experienced poverty firsthand growing up. And so they've got the kind of personal knowledge that tends to be key to unlocking really effective solutions to problems, whatever we're talking about. And the, the, as, as Charles is, would say, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. The, um, the results that the Family Independence Initiatives gets 
in terms of empowering families who are in poverty to emerge from poverty, from rise out of, to, to rise out of poverty, are off the charts. Uh, especially when you compare them to some of the top-down alternatives that so permeate what, what society. Do they, can you explain a little bit of what they actually do? So. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great model. So, you know, whereas the top-down approach looks at people in poverty as a problem to be solved, and it brings people from the outside in to try to kind of tell them what to do, Family Independence Initiative takes the opposite approach. They bring families who are in similar situations in poverty together under the idea that the solution to those families' poverty exists within the families. But just like all of us, they need some help in order to right. really emerge. They need capital, social capital and financial capital. And through, through some, some pretty simple tools, the Family Independence Initiative helps those families to express their goals and then to work together to help each other achieve those goals. And this very Tocquevillian notion of mutual assistance but 27% of the families uh, that participate in these programs after two years uh, rise out of poverty and stay out of poverty, which is extraordinary, again, relative to the, to the alternative. They double their savings. Um, and, and, and again, this is a sort of based on this deep belief in people, right? We believe in those families, and then we recognize that, you know, that many of us, including Jesus and, and Mauricio and the team there, They've got some some skills and some things that can help those families to achieve uh, more than they otherwise could. And the and the starting point, to, as we found, learned the hard way, is it, to believe in people is to recognize that everyone has a gift, that everyone has something to offer, and we learned that from multiple intelligence theory from. Ricardo's uh, law of comparative advantage, the division of labor by comparative advantage which is what raised humanity out of eternal uh, dire poverty. The, 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 that people started to be empowered to, to, to try things, to do things, and focus on what they were good at, recognize what they were good at and what they were not, and focus, mm -hmm. and then exchange with others. Right. And then this brought about this whole uh, uh, change in the culture from everybody uh, uh, in conflict with other with each other to to cooperating to supporting each other to assisting each other by trading but each concentrating on what they do best and 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 exchanging and this also happens to follow the second law of thermodynamics which you 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 know very well is that <laughs> Is I that, live the second law of thermodynamics. Yeah, I've, I've I been mean, tending towards entropy since I was born. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that that use, entropy, uselessness, uh, and uh, and waste increases in a closed system. So we all need to be open. And what does that mean? It means open to to different ideas, different people, different things different approaches, and so try to find common ground with others. Charles, could you, you know, one of the things that I think uh, people reading the book will be uh, interested to understand is uh, you're kind of the two, two of the major figures uh, whose thought you're following. There's Friedrich Hayek on the one hand, that's not gonna be surprising to anybody who knows uh, free market economics and whatnot, but also Abraham Maslow. Can you talk about how these two guys kind of fit together for you and, and how that, that energizes a lot of what you're doing? When, when I think of, of the, them in, in, uh, in harmony, I think of, uh, of uh, Hayek's uh, statement of what probably the greatest discovery in the history of mankind was, and that is that people can live together in peace and to their mutual uh, advantage uh, uh, without having to agree on common aims by only being bound by abstract rules of conduct. Now, what does that say? That says bottom up is what works. And that's what Maslow said. He said, what you can be, you must be. If you, don't, if you don't develop your capabilities and realize your potential, you may be successful externally, 
but you will be deeply unhappy because you're not fulfilling your gifts, your nature. And so that's the way that's done is bottom up. Each person discovering their gift, de turning it into valued skills, and then using it to succeed by contributing. So they're both coming from it. And this is what I find and, and with the second law of thermodynamics, they all fit. And this is what, when I started studying this, the, these, I became fascinated and it transformed my life studying these principles of human progress. The ones I, I really gravitated, those were, it was from all the different disciplines and perspectives, they came together, they reinforced each other. And, and those are the ones that worked in history that lifted societies up and headed them toward more, to, toward the ability to enable more people to realize their potential and contribute and work in harmony and peace. So Nick, the real opportunity that we see in, in at Stand Together is how do you translate those big insights into actual action that can help empower people to overcome the challenges? So we talked about the Family Independence Initiative as an example of a program that does that. But, but no program uh, can, can do it all on its own, right? There's no single solution to the big problems that, that we're tr trying to solve. And so what we put forward in the book is that what's necessary is this comprehensive approach. So you take what Charles just said seriously. How do we really help to uh, put society in a position where they're empowering people to discover their own paths in a way that satisfies themselves, finds fulfillment by helping others? And so programs like Family Independence Initiative are important because communities play a critical role in empowering people, but we know public policy does as well, right? And so you've got to identify those barriers in policy, say, that are, that are perpetuating poverty, things like occupational licensure, that sort of thing. But, but for a long time, we've kind of left a lot of the other opportunities in society off the table. Uh, businesses. And do you think, is that, is that coming out of, uh, from a, a kind of rigid libertarian idea that you know, the government shouldn't be involved in it, so we're not really going to talk about it. No, no, the, the government has a role, but it's, I mean, government is one of what we look at it as four uh, uh, types of institutions. One are community institutions, educational institutions, business institutions, and government institutions. And what our goal is, is to help each one move toward doing the things that empower people to improve their lives and the lives of others and move toward this society of equal rights and mutual benefit. So the policies, so we, 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 we work with thousands of social entrepreneurs mm -hmm. across all four of these sets of institutions. And, and what we do is support those who are going in that direction. And we don't ask for, per, for perfection if we find they agree with us on one. They may disagree with us on all the others, but we will work with them on that one. And that's the only way we found we can get, we can move society forward in that. Yeah, at, at uh, various points in the book, Frederick Douglass, the uh, 19th century abolitionist orator, uh, comes up a lot, uh, particularly in this concept of uniting with anybody to do good. Brian, you know, uh, Frederick Douglass, social entrepreneur, I mean, it's kind of one way of talking about him, but why, how does he inhabit or personify? Well, um, let me, may, may I take that? Because yeah, sure. I'm the, I'm the, as you say, <laughs> as you saw in the book, I have uh, my two, uh, I, I, I list three categories of people that have influenced me and in my, my two heroes are Frederick Douglass and Viktor Frankl. And, and Frederick Douglass, particularly because of what he overcame to, to be empowered, what he did with it, to not be vengeful or hateful, but to help everybody, to eliminate mm -hmm. all kinds of injustices. And then he wrote about the aha moments, the very things we've been talking about. For example, he, he, he found or he realized that he wasn't enslaved because he was inferior, but because he was being kept ignorant. So he taught himself to read when he was eight. Then at age 16, he, he had the opportunity to teach Sunday school. 
So he taught them to read. And it, here's what his comment was. At last, I have found a way to contribute. Mm -hmm. So he was contribution motivated, even as enslaved. And then he, he escaped and he got a job. And he says, I'm not only a free man, I'm a free working man. And then he went to these abolitionist rallies and finally they called on him, but when all the top uh, abolitionists were speaking, Garrison and, and the rest, and, and he was the best. So he found his gift and he dedicated his life to that and became very successful. And then a powerful, one of the top social entrepreneurs in our history. And uh, uh, Brian, I will point out that uh, it was the Irish who beat up Frederick Douglass when he was free in the North. I, so, I, I'll yeah. take that as I'll take you, that as you, a, a personal dig based on yes. our, our history together, Nick. Our common, uh, our common, uh, yes, heritage. I, I, I think it's important though to to note. I mean, we learn so much from guys like Douglas and other of these just unbelievable social entrepreneurs who overcame you know unimaginable barriers. Right. But I think we make a mistake if we say, well, they can do it, and therefore you know I can't, or other people can't. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do in the book is also share stories of modern day people who exemplify the same sort of path that Douglas, recognizing that, that nobody today struggles with what, what he had to. Right. Uh, what's a, who's a, who's a, a good short example of that? We look at a guy like Anton Lucky, for instance, right, who's just this phenomenal guy we met four or five years ago, part of a group called Urban Specialists. Anton, uh, early on, about 14 years old, started the most violent gang in Dallas, the, the Bloods. Uh, went on to, um, you know, as one does after you start a gang when you're 14, uh, spend time in prison. But Antong in prison begins this personal transformation, which follows remarkably the path that Charles just described for Douglas. Right. And, and long story short, he comes out of prison having discovered his leadership gifts and is now applying them to help other kids uh, go down a better path than he did. And, and you say, well, geez, that's great. Maybe Anton can help thousands of kids during his lifetime, which, which he will. But it's more than that. By pointing out what Anton is able to accomplish, right? somebody who most of the, the rest of the country or society wouldn't really believe in, right? when we believe in a guy like Anton and we tell his story and we celebrate what he's done, he inspires thousands of others to look within themselves to figure out how they can contribute. Can we uh, talk, you know, at, at some point, so right now we're, we're kind of talking about um, community efforts to help, you know, people at, at a very um, kind of fundamental level, family unit, gangs, things like that, a even educational institutions. At one point in the book, you write, America needs a better business culture. And it's, you know, it's clear that a lot of people, certainly you guys do, I do, you know, we express ourselves, we express our core values, our desires, our aspirations through the work that we do. Um, Coke Industries makes a lot and lot of money because it's doing, you know, it's making things that people want at a price that they're willing to pay. Talk about the uh, two things, I guess. Um, Charles, at one point you write that uh, when you took over Coke Industries after your father died in the late 60s, you had to change the company's culture to one of empowerment, not control. Can you explain a little bit what, what that meant? Right. And, well, know, it was, it was uh, before my father talked me into joining the company by telling me he was, he was very ill and so he wasn't able to really run the company. And so it wasn't doing that well and, and he didn't have long to live. So either I come back to run it or, or he would have to sell it. And, and, I, and he said, you, you already own a piece of the company. So I was looking for entrepreneurial opportunity and I didn't think I'd get a better offer than that one. So I, and he was true to his word. I mean, he had been growing up, he had been tough on me. He had me work at, at tough jobs from the time I was six, all my free time, because he didn't want me to be a country club bum. But I was reluctant to come back because I didn't need more tough stuff. I wanted to be independent. But but he gave me that offer and he was true to his word. So, so he said I could run it any way I wanted, except I needed his approval to sell it. And, and so I, first thing I saw is there was a protectionist mentality in the company. And that is, we're not gonna do new things. We're not gonna take risks. We're just gonna do the status quo. And 
I'm coming and I'm a kid. I, no, I want to do new things. I want to blow it up. And, and, and so I, as I was learning these principles of human progress, I, I created this uh, model of, 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 of succeeding by creating virtuous cycles of mutual benefit in the company. And what, what that means is you figure out what capabilities you have that will create value for others, starting with customers, but also your employees, your suppliers, uh, your communities and society as a whole. And, and so, so that's what, so we changed the whole, and then you continually transform yourself to do more and more to build additional capabilities. And this leads to new opportunities and the new opportunities lead to the need to create new capabilities and so on in never ending cycles of improvement and progress. And that's what we started doing. And this stuff worked. That's why I say it transformed my life. I didn't think I was that capable and I wasn't. The ideas were. And so, so, so we focused on creating value for others and empowering our employees from the bottom up. Yeah, what, what does that mean? Because uh, you know, one of the things I've read all of your books over the years and I've heard a lot about market-based management and I, intellectually, I understand the idea and it sounds great. But then as a former manager myself, I'm, I, I, I don't know how to implement it. What does it mean to kind of set your employees free to well, it, figure it, out what the, to do? Every, the first job of every supervisor is to enable their reports, their employees to self-actualize. And what that means is they work with employees to find what gifts they have, what they'll be passionate about, and then rather than stick them in a role, most of which they aren't good at, design the roles to fit the capabilities of the employees, and then give them the tools. And with the technology today, we've, for example, we've invested in nearly 30 billion in technology within the last decade. And we use this technology not to control our employees, but to empower them and, and give them the tools and the knowledge and, and the authority to make more decisions. And we are getting innovations, improvements from, from all levels through their, and that passion has gone up. So, so when I look at society and what could be done and how you change the culture, I mean, I look at, at what the, how this is working here. So this isn't just a theory. This is something I see every day. Well, and just you, to set uh, what the stakes are, Nick, I mean, 70% of people, almost 70% of people report that they are completely disengaged from their job. They don't find any fulfillment in their job. So you think about the human potential that's just being lost by the way business typically runs. If you can change that and you do things like what Charles just talked about, focus on self-actualization in the workplace. I mean, not only are you going to get personal value out of it, but think about the productivity you can unleash. You know, uh, Charles, in the book, you say that, you, you know, your, your basic dynamic is trial and error. And you emphasize that you made a lot of errors during uh, your career. What, what's one of the biggest kind of signature mistakes that you made as the head of Coke Industries? Well, I look at it as I, I'm, I'm, I follow the Stoic philosophy. That is, uh, uh, grateful for everything and entitled to nothing. And, I, and this is uh, consistent with Thomas Edison's philosophy. You remember when he, he, he had... Uh, uh, all these, he tried all these things to make a new battery, 9,000 things that didn't work. And his friend said, well, God, I'm sorry you had all this failures. He said, I haven't had any failures. I've found 9,000 things that don't work. <laughs> and I look at, at our failures and that's what's made us successful. Yeah. So what, and if what's you're, a big and, one? And if you're, don't, if you're not, the only way you can never make a mistake or never have a failure if you don't try anything new. And guess what that means? You have total failure because you're going out of business given the, the process of creative destruction that's going on at, at uh, uh, light speed pace today. So we're ramping it up. 
So we're, we're driving more creative destruction and what we tell every employee, whatever you're doing, now you may be best at the world at what you're doing. Our business may be the leader in all that. It's not good enough. If we don't improve faster than others, we're going out of business and get everybody think so everybody comes to work how how do i uh, how do i drive innovation and find new and better ways to create more value for our customers and our other constituencies. One of the uh, uh, more interesting sections of the book, I think, is uh, when you're talking about uh, kind of building a business, a better business culture, um, you guys really go after corporate welfare. You talk about a corporate welfare crisis. Um, and I would like you to uh, talk a little bit about uh, Coke Industries was a major producer of ethanol and yet you lobbied to end direct subsidies of ethanol. Um, how did you sell that to your investors? How did you sell that to your employees? Um, because that seems to be, you know, a, you know, that sounds like it would be kind of a tough sell. Because our, because this is, we don't, we, I mean, we train uh, everybody, educate all our employees in our philosophy. And, uh, and a good part of their rewards are they helping us build this culture of creating value for others. And it, when, when, when people focus in their career on creating value for others rather than gaming the system and, mm -hmm. and trying to be succeed by tricks or playing politics or whatever, it transforms them, it changes their habits. I can't tell you how many employees have retired uh, or, or left the company who either come in to see me or write me and tell me that this transformed their life. Now, now it not, and not only in business, but in, the, in working with their, their children, with their families, uh, in their philanthropy. I've, even some say, this, I, I've, I've worked with my, my, my church or my synagogue to help them be more effective in helping their parishioners. So this this stuff is so powerful. You can see at 85, people ask me why you why you work so hard now, because I'm, I mean, what am I going to do? I love doing this, <laughs> and when I see that it really helps people and empowers them, man, that's what makes my day. So a big uh, error that you kind of confess to or discuss in the book is uh, having spent a lot of time trying to elect mostly Republicans uh, in, in political battles. You had you know, infamous, notorious, uh, coveted uh, seminars a couple times a year for many years where you raised money for particular uh, uh, politicians. And you said, uh, you know, the, the Wall Street Journal quoted you, this is in the book, boy, did we screw up, what a mess, talking about partisanship. Um, how did you how did you come to the understanding that trying to uh, kind of work the political system in that way was was not working? Well, I I I, I always had that that view. I uh, well, I've been at this for nearly sixty years, and for the uh, the first fifty, I wasn't in politics at all because politics, uh, as you as you see, everything we we try to do is based on mutual benefit. And politics can't do that because it isn't win-win, it's win-lose. You're running against somebody and either you win, it's not gonna be mutual benefit. So, and, and, that's, and then, uh, then I've taken to heart what George Washington's insight in his farewell address, uh, beware of political parties because they'll tell you they're there to help you and they're really there to gain and keep power. So we stayed out of politics in that, but then we got So why, in. why did you get into politics? Well, that's then? what, that's it, what it I It seemed was, like you were, you were kind of on the right path. What, yeah, what drew you but, into Okay, it? so we, we started getting into policies. Okay, because we realized we can't just do it with education and empowering people. We've got to have policies that allow this. If we have too many policies that are holding people back that aren't based on equal rights and mutual benefit, that aren't, that are keeping people from realizing their potential. So we needed to change those policies. And then as we got into that, okay, it's hard to find politicians that will really 
work to empower people or have policy. Mm -hmm. So we need to help elect some. And then Brian can can tell how we <laughs> how we got it because I, I I I don't say the right things when I get into. It. <laughs> well, you know, this is a libertarian podcast, so you can curse. Uh, that's right. That's right. If you're going to curse, it's cursing. going to be. A, no, you know, there, there's a there's a pretty big misunderstanding, I think, about uh, even the extent to involvement in politics back in the middle 2010s, right? Which is really when when this experiment was going on. Right. But and even this at was the heyday after the financial crisis was kind of the between say know, the, 2009, the catalyst, right? 2010, yeah. and 2014 was this experiment with hey, if we want to find politicians that are going to be truer to the principles of empowerment, let's get engaged in politics, right? And figure out if we can do it. We, we played the game like, like everybody does. We picked a team it, in case it was the Republicans, not because we were Republicans or because we had any love for right. the party necessarily, but because we thought that was going to be the most productive way to find people that would pass policies to empower people. Three cycles later, experiment run, recognize, hey, this isn't working the way that it, it ought to. So let's do so something different. But even at that heyday of, of our involvement in the political process, that was never more than 10% of everything that this philanthropic community was doing. And it's never exceeded that today. It's less than that. But we're still engaged in politics. We're just doing it differently. Yeah. Well, let me just point out that politicians like uh, women of easy virtue come pretty cheaply. So you don't have to spend that much, right? You're not going to get us to curse, Nick. <laughs> You're not going to get us to curse. <laughs> uh, but um, so, yeah, you, you talk in the book about, um, you know, that you picked uh, partisanship or uh, uh, you, partisanship over kind of policy. Um, and then you're talking about part, partnership over partisanship. So well, wait, wait, uh, we never will, we never picked partnership yeah. partisanship over policy. We thought for a while partisanship would be the path towards better policy. Yeah. But again, you know, you live and learn. And what what do you think we didn't. what went wrong with the Republican Party? Well, because, it's, you know, just, well it, yeah. I don't think so. It's it's what George Washington said. What I mean, what is the what is the politicians uh, profit and loss? It's whether they mm -hmm. get reelected. That's profit, and if they lose, they had a big loss. So, so they're going to do whatever will get reelected. So we had all these. We supported these politicians, who, uh, who said they were for all this stuff. We, 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 we vetted them on that, and they were saying all the right things. And then I'd be watching TV. And they would be coming up for the opposite. I, I, you know, I got to tell you, uh, Charles, it's hard to take you seriously now if you're only now or only a few years ago was realizing that politicians lie when they're moving no. their lips. No, I, I told you I stayed out of it for 50 years, but I got sucked into it. Who and were the, anyway, who so were the I said to Brian, I said, I said, Brian, we've got to change. Who who were the big disappointments? Can I, uh, you know, I, I, I hate to use a trope from the left, but name some names. Who were the biggest disappointments that you you guys kind of backed? You said, like, these are good bets to pursue limited effective government strategies. And then they just didn't deliver. I think what we're more interested in talking about is what does it look like going forward? Right. And this is what we talk about in the book is, look, what you learn from that experience is not that politicians lie. Of course, we, we knew that. Right. But what you learn is that the party system is structured not to produce good policy, but mm -hmm. to produce perpetual party. And so how do you disrupt that? How do you change those dynamics? Because, look, even when you talk to the folks in, in Congress, right, people are frustrated. You know, a lot of those folks didn't come here to do what's going on right now, but they don't and it's see worth a better pointing way. out. However unpopular Donald Trump has been uh, during his presidency, uh, Congress is, is like half as popular. So yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, that's you right. Know, they have their own problems to deal with. But but policy coalitions can be formed not through this notion of sort of bipartisanship, which which doesn't tend to lead to much profound outcome, but through a real nonpartisan approach. Right. The idea that we'll work with anybody to do right, regardless of party. And yeah, it's talk produced about outcomes. that in, in the context of because uh, you guys were heavily involved in this with criminal justice yeah. reform right. and the first step back. And that seems to be a place where an unlikely coalition of people who didn't have a lot in common except for those issues in the criminal justice bucket came together um, and, you know, and actually got something done. And we see that as a model. You know, so you look at criminal justice reform. What happened is exactly as you said, we looked for common ground rather than focusing on the things that separated us with the groups that we worked with. Put together a coalition of well over 30 groups, right? Everybody from the ACLU to the American Conservative Union 
the uh, National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Officers. I mean, you name it. It was a, a who's who of a, of a coalition, real diverse. And what that did was it said to politicians, hey, in the past, you know, for 25 years, I mean, you know, this reasons worked on this as, as well as anybody has. Criminal justice reform was off limits because you'd get Willie Horton, right? If you were a Republican or a Democrat, if you dared to speak the truth about the criminal justice system, you risked uh, your opponent basically pointing to the, the one person that, that did harm. And, and that would come back to, uh, to, to get you out of office. So all these diverse groups came back and said, I don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican, do the right thing. We got your back. And because of the diversity of that coalition, that it, it was robust and it, was, it allowed both parties to do the right thing. That's a model that we think we can apply to a lot of different issues. Yeah, what are, what are some of those other issues that you're particularly interested, on, uh, interested in? I mean, the one that is ready to go right now and we're very hopeful going forward is immigration. In what way? Uh, I mean, we have, uh, you know, one of the weird, uh, and maybe obviously, uh, you know, uh, it was gonna turn out this way, but uh, under Donald Trump, who was elected being very anti-immigrant, uh, pro-immigrant uh, sentiment in America is at historic highs. That's right. Um, That's right. But it's also true that George Bush, who won re-election in 2004, made comprehensive immigration reform. And, you know, it was kind of good, good reform. It was more friendly to immigrants. Didn't get it passed. Uh, Obama didn't get it passed. So how, how are you going to affect change in immigration? We, we, right we think the change maker here is what we just talked about. In, in all of those past cases, you pursue a partisan strategy, right? Like that's the way the policy making has always been done in DC. But if we can bring the kind of diverse coalition that we brought to criminal justice reform to an issue like improving our immigration system, you change the dynamic, right? We also see it, for instance, on foreign policy, you know, stopping the crazy adventurism that is so counterproductive, you know, foreign wars that have nothing to do with national security. Here again, you've got a dynamic at 70% of the country thinks we ought to be out of Afghanistan. Why aren't we, right? Because neither party wants to give the other a win. But if you can bring that diverse coalition to that, you can make really important changes that, that help people's lives, that help the national security and help our fiscal situation, by the way. Right. Can I ask, uh, related to this, where, uh, where is Koch Industries or where is the uh, Charles Koch uh, Foundation on an issue like climate change, uh, which seems to be, it has become a background issue where everybody is, everybody basically acknowledges that climate change is happening, that human activity contributes to it, and that, you know, we got to do something about it. Where does that fit into the kind of basket of, uh, of things that you're pursuing? Yeah, well, I've, as, as you've, you've seen, I've, I've, I've commented on this on several interviews, and uh, and so for, for many years, I've been saying that, okay, the temperature has been rising for over a century now and human activity has contributed to it. But the approach is wrong. This top-down approach, which they're using uh, supposedly around the world and emissions keep rising. So it's not accomplishing what, what does it, what has accomplished and will accomplish it are innovations, bottom-up innovations that, for example, uh, substitute uh, natural gas for coal. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is what we're working on at Coke Industries. As I said, we've, uh, we've uh, invested nearly uh, $30 billion in technology. And, and that's led to us uh, let's say our, our production of fossil fuels a decade ago was maybe around a half of our business. Now it's just a fraction. And our emissions are, are less uh, across the board in our plants. And we're, we're working on inventing things that will uh, do two things, not just uh, have less emissions, but will be cheaper and more affordable rather than much more expensive and unreliable, which makes people's lives worse. So our, our, we go back to our basic, you know, we, we're committed to making people's lives better to, and succeed through mutual benefits. So we've, we've developed a s system to automate uh, the detection of, of uh, emissions from plants, of releases. And, and that greatly re reduces the number and magnitude of releases. We've, we've developed a, uh, a, a superior 5G 
uh, uh, connection system, communication system for electric cars. We've invested in a company that that has electric vehicles for delivery yards where the whole thing is automated and we're not only invested in them, we're using this in our, in our, uh, our, our plants. Uh, and then we've invested in a, a, a new a small scale modular nu nuclear plant technology that, I mean, that's a huge, could make a huge difference and it's safer and cheaper if it once again doesn't get overregulated, so it makes it impossible, um, and so on. Of, and I, yeah. I could go on and on. Yeah. These well, are the things know, we're doing because we believe that's 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 the future, and that that's the only way we can deal with whatever these problems are going to be in the future from temperature rising, is through bottom-up innovations. You know, you mentioned regulation and uh, Donald Trump, uh, who, uh, you know, in, in his four years in office and likely his only four years in office, he uh, came in talking about deregulating things. And most of the business people I know that I've talked to have said that there was a palpable difference during the Trump years than under the Obama years, for instance, and that regulation seemed to lessen, even if you don't necessarily see it in the number of pages in the Federal Register and things like that. How do you guys feel, uh, and not just about business, but like, was Donald Trump good for the country? And then also, what are you looking forward to? What's good about Biden and what, what worries you about as we move into a new political era? Well, Nick, my, my sense is that that's what a lot of people are asking in the country right now. But like we write in the book, right? There is so much more to life than politics that if we, if we ask too much of politicians, whoever they are, whatever party, we are as a country likely to be disappointed. And so what we're trying to do is encourage people to look beyond sort of that narrow lens of politics. Look, politics plays an important role, but it's a limited role. And that's by design in our country. We want to find ways that people can come together outside of politics, government policy. I, I am to right solve there problems. with you, but let me press you, Brian. I mean, was was Trump was it, you know, was it, was it a good thing that he was president for four years and kind of burned down certain types of institutions? And when we look at somebody like Joe Biden, and I'm thinking, you know, from a, from a kind of standard libertarian analysis, Joe Biden promised $11 trillion in new spending. He's not going to be able to deliver on that. But like, does that make you look forward to the future or does it make it harder to get outside of politics? Did Trump actually make it harder to get outside of politics because we all talked about him every minute of every day. I'll, I'll put it this way. I think that there are a lot of ideas that are being offered um, to solve some very real problems in our country, right? I mean, the division in our country is real. I think it's a reflection of deeper challenges that we talk about in the book, the core institutions, not empowering people to keep up with the pace of change. And, and different flavors of top down can appeal because they seem almost like magic wands. But what we try to do in the book is show, as, as history does, that it's a lot tougher than that, right? That they're really the only way to overcome some of these problems is not to take, you know, whatever it is, the, the flavor of the, of the top down of the day, but really do the hard work to help to build an inclusive society that empowers everybody. And so that's, I mean, that's, that's what we're focused on. That's what we think the, the future can hold. And, and look, politicians are going to play an important role in that because government policy creates the conditions for these other institutions to be productive. Uh, but ultimately, the majority of energy needs to be outside of government, outside of government policy in the voluntary sector. Right. I mean, I mean, this is this is reason. This is what 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 we've dedicated yeah. our, our well, careers. This to. this is a, a, a good way to pivot to the libertarian movement. And Charles, you know, more more than any uh, individual uh, and, and certainly with you and and your brother, uh, you created, envisioned, funded uh, the libertarian movement as we know it. The, I believe the oldest institution that you are you know, continuously involved with was the Institute for Humane Studies. Uh, most of the operations that you're talking about are in this voluntary sector. Could you talk about what, um, what drew you to something like IHS and you know, how has that played out and how does that kind of... Um, reflect your vision of what uh, libertarian philanthropy and a libertarian society should look like? Well, what, uh, what drew me to the, the Institute was that, uh, it, as I said, that 
these ideas transformed my life and enabled me to accomplish more than I ever dreamed. And, and so I wanted to help as many other people as possible be exposed to these ideas so they could help them do the same. And that's what the Institute was working on. And I, and I guess just for people who don't know, the Institute for Humane Studies funds seminars, scholarships, uh, academics for college uh, students as well as professors, young faculty, people who are involved in um, having a life of the mind. Yeah, and that's the same thing with the Mercatus Center does, does uh, similar things in, in a somewhat different methodology. And that's what attracted me. And that's where I met Brian when he first came to work out there out of college. So those are the kind of institutions I was, uh, I was in, interested in. And, but, but we were, uh, the, 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 the people who believed in these bottom-up ideas, uh, it was mainly talking about the theory and the history, how it worked through history. Mm -hmm. And I said, we, we've got to deal with, show how it can deal with real problems. And so that's, that's why I helped start the Cato Institute, to take these abstractions and apply them to real issues. And, and then I said, well, we've also got to uh, 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 show that these ideas really work to change people's lives. So we've got to go find people, professors, uh, people in communities. I, I provided the seed capital for the Institute for Justice to start. Mm -hmm. I started an organization in the 70s called, well, we initially named it BLAST, Business Leaders Against Subsidies and Tariffs. And I got Milton Friedman to, to work with me to become the, the chairman of, of, uh, of the advisors. And, and the idea was to get business people to, to see that they're better off not going for short-term profits, rigging the system, and really creating value for others. And you know, a typical letter I got back, I mean, no one would have answered me, but because Milton was there, they said, God, I love what you and Milton are doing. I totally agree with it, but it doesn't apply to my industry. For example, one made jeans, and he said, he, he said, uh, gosh, because if we're put out of business by, by foreign competition, who's going to make the boys jeans in times of war? <laughs> and so, oh my God. So anyway, so we changed it to Citizens for a Sound Economy. Uh, and, and because citizens, citizens, leaders, yeah. citizens were the ones who were getting screwed by this. Uh, and the business people were making money short term. Of course, long term, they're destroying society with this. But, but that's just a minor point, I guess. What you did and uh, from things that I've read and, you know, just talking with people, one of the things that you did, Charles, was you kind of envisioned a series of parallel institutions. Um, you know, if, if libertarian thought was certainly not represented, it wasn't even represented in the Republican Party, really, in the 60s very much. Uh, much less in the media, much less in academia, much less in kind of business roundtables. Um, I mean, do you feel like you succeeded in helping to create a kind of sources of parallel information and um, and kind of community building or mission building? Uh, you know, well, well I feel this when, for example, when we were first, I first got involved in the Institute of Humane Studies, we would be lucky to get six professors in the country to come to participate in a seminar. Now, depending on how you count them, there are thousands of professors who are doing it. So, and so that's in that. And then, and then what we've done, my wife and I 30 years ago started an organization called Youth Entrepreneurs in one school in a, in a tough area to help these kids find their gift. And so it's not just classroom, what, what I call one-dimensional schooling, teach to test, top down, everybody treated the same, but tailored for each individual. And, and it blew me away that these kids who were failing everything started making straight A's and they were transformed and then called, went on to be successful. And now it's in over 20 states and we have sponsors in all these states that are, that are helping it work. 
So, so it was, so I look at all those things we did in all the institutions and how it's, uh, it's helped. And now, now we, we work with people across the whole ideological spectrum and all the institutions. Now, how do we get it so it's critical mass and it reaches everybody? And that's what we're, you asked what we're doing in the future. We've got to scale this and we've got to get the message out a lot better. And that's what we hope believe in people will help do. Yeah, uh, Brian, I, that's, um, you know, I've, I've been at Reason for 27 years, I believe. I know you've been involved in uh, IHS, Mercatus, et cetera. For, 20 years. What, 20 years? 20 years, yeah. yeah. And, you know, we can certainly say that in that past time, our reach, our visibility, I think our influence has gotten bigger, but it's, you know, it's not where I think anybody in the libertarian movement would like it to be, you know. And um, so what, what are the deficiencies in the existing kind of, uh, you know, structures or organizations or mindsets? And where do you see it going? Because as the head of CKI, you're going to be in a position where you can real, you're going to be making a lot of bets on what's going to play in the future. So could you talk about that? Yeah. Look, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two answers, right? And I think they, they're complementary. Uh, one, I think, is a, a mechanical answer, right? We, we need to do a better job of the mechanics of sharing the opportunities for people to get engaged in really empowering people from the bottom up, right? I mean, that, that's ultimately what, what we're talking about, helping people mm -hmm. to find how they can live their best lives by contributing the lives of others. That's, that's the liberal project. And, and from a mechanical perspective, organizations that have been dedicated to that mission, we've been pretty clunky. And we're getting better, I think. You know, I mean, these 27 years, 20 years, we've seen a lot of improvement over time. We've got a ways to go. There, we can talk about that if you're interested. I think there's some pretty basic stuff that can be done to dramatically improve the effectiveness. What, what, what's one quick example? Practice what we preach, right? This division of labor by comparative advantage. For a long time, you remember this, right? There were these organizations that were kind of silos, right? Each one of our groups, well, we were, we were the one that were gonna save the world, right? We could, we could solve it all on our own. And we'd see each other at, at events and parties, cocktail parties, that sort of thing. And we'd, we'd talk to each other, but we wouldn't really work together. And that's changing quite a lot. And I think that's a really positive sign. And then just to interject, then back in the early days, there was a lot of divisiveness and people not speaking to each other. I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, gosh, we got to work together. <laughs> but but the, more, the more fundamental answer, Nick, I think, and this is the thing that I, I, I think, you know, what Reason's doing right now and some other groups, I think is really, really productive on this front. We got to take up Hayek's challenge. Right. We got to once again make the building of a free society an intellectual adventure, or as he says, a deed of courage. And if there's ever time for courage for those of us who believe that that liberalism and empowering people to find new and better ways to contribute in society. If there was ever a time for us to sort of stand up with courage and advocate for that. I mean, now is the time. And so if we can bring that spirit into our efforts and as Charles says, put together, put aside some of these petty divisions and welcome more and more people who are out there looking for a better way into this liberal project, right? This, this, this charge that Hayek has, has given us for generations. I, I mean, I think we ought, to be, we ought to expect to see a whole lot more uh, progress. And, you know, the, look, let's not lament where we are. You know, Don Boudreau's a, 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 somebody who always reminds me, hey, we got our problems and we do, but time horizon matters. And so if you look, say, from the 60s until today, and you just consider the number of people in the world that are living under more liberal conditions, however you want to measure that. I mean, it's a tremendous success of these ideas. And I think we got to keep that perspective in mind as well. Well, the other, the other inside of Hayek's is, is to, to make progress. You can't continue to use the language that worked decades ago. You've got to find where people are, particularly young people, and what language appeals to them and put it in those terms. So you, we have to go where people are and show them these ideas in ways they will relate to. And that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. And people say, well, that isn't the way we used to talk about it. Well, no, we got to innovate. We've got yeah. to do things differently. Now, you know, if they don't want to hear praxeology, they can go to hell. <laughs> yeah. We got, we got to, uh, you know, we're... You well, know. I was going to name my, my, <laughs> my first bu book, The Epistemology of Praxeology. <laughs> and it was pointed out that would only appeal to you. <laughs> you know, Russ, Russ Roberts, another guy that, that, that's familiar to your, your uh, 
crowd is, um, I used to work with him at the Mercatus Center for a long time. He would say, you know, he, Russ wrote novels, right? That was his idea to try to get more people engaged in ideas. He would say to me, look, Brian, as much as we'd like them to, nobody's sitting around campfires singing songs about praxeology, yeah. right? But today, I mean, we've got the opportunity. You know, the examples in the book, people like Scott Strode, people like Anton Lucky, people like, um, like the other social entrepreneurs, they are literally sitting around singing songs about the work that they're doing. I mean, these are the, the heroes of liberalism going forward. And then we get musicians together. And they're singing and, songs. And they're, oh my God. And they tell their stories about how they overcame it and then they have a song about it. Oh, boy, boy it brings tears to your eyes. I guess this is a good time to invoke Bob Dylan, uh, <laughs> who shows up very early in the book. And, uh, you know, it, arguably one of the most controversial claims in your book is that you say that Bob Dylan absolutely deserved the 2016 Nobel Prize for Literature. I heartily agree. Um, Charles, you, you quote uh, from uh, It's All Right, Mom, Only Bleeding uh, early on in the book. Uh, he not busy being born is busy dying. Uh, expand on that a little bit. How does, how does that summarize a lot of what well, you're talking about? Well, uh, I mean, Bob Dylan is like me. He's, he's, uh, he's totally committed and obsessed with his gift. And he has a gift for understanding the human condition and putting that in a way that people relate to through his songs. So he's he has a tremendous gift. I understand that if he's having a party and a song starts to come, he, he leaves the party and goes down to his, his studio and writes the song while it's with him. And that's, he reminds me yeah. of me. <laughs> the kind <laughs> of thing I would do, I wish I could write a song. Yeah. But no, he, he has, is, uh, he, he's constantly reinvented himself as well. Yeah, I mean, no, absolutely. He, yeah. That's it, continual transformation. And and he is amazing. I have his whole book of songs, which I I refer to. And I there's so many that have great, powerful messages in them that yeah. it's just it's very inspiring. You think of Dylan never picked up an electric guitar, right? right? Because he kind of he stayed within the bounds of what was. And look, he was a very successful folk musician at the time, but he broke those barriers. And I mean, imagine the music that we wouldn't have today if he hadn't done that. Right. Brian, do you, you're also a Dylan fan. Uh, what is, what's your favorite Dylan song? <laughs> if you have It's one. an impossible question to answer, right? But I'll, I'll give you one and I won't explain why. It's uh, Blood on the Tracks. It's called Idiot Wind. Sure. And I'm going to, I'm going to stop talking at that. Okay. That. <laughs> That's uh, yeah. It's a wonder we can even feed ourselves. You got so. it. You got it. Uh, in my, this, my, will, mine is will... just, mine is Forever Young. Yes. All right. And, oh, and there's two versions of that on the same album. So that's uh, yeah. you, you can pick a choose. Being born. Uh, as a final question, uh, Charles, I, you, you and, and your brother, um, who was a longtime trustee on uh, Reasons Board of Trustees, you guys were among the most hated people in America, you know, for many years. You may, may still well be, uh, you know, and kind of the way that George Soros had became this icon of hatred and contempt for people on the right. Just uh, what did it? What does it feel like to be, you know, the subject of that kind of attention? Well, I, I like I, I I'm a big fan of Karl Popper's scientific method, which is develop a a testable proposition and then go find what's wrong with it and get other people to criticize it. And why do I do that? And that's the way we run our business, because my my little ego is strong enough to handle the criticism, but it isn't strong enough to handle the massive failures that come by not getting better knowledge. And I don't know why everybody doesn't have that rather than protect their ego. I don't want to, I know all the answers, shut up, do what I say, and then have disasters. And so I, I look at the criticism. I mean, some is constructive, Mm -hmm. And and then okay, we need to learn from that. And then I need then learn okay, why why are these people doing it? Or do they want to shut us down? And then how, okay, how do we how do we deal with that? So each of these attacks is I find very educational. So I I want to learn from them, and learn where they're coming from, how we deal with that, because I want to be successful. 
And unless you can deal with criticism and overcome it, uh, uh, you're, uh, you're never going to be successful. Like, like John Stuart Mill says, those who only know their side of the case know little of that. Well, we're going to leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Brian Hooks of the Charles Koch Institute and of Stand Together, Charles Koch of Koch Industries. The book is Believe in People, Bottom-Up Solutions for a Top-Down World. Gentlemen, thanks so much for talking to Reason today. Thanks, Thank Nick. Thank you, Nick. It was fun. Great, great interview. <laughs>